This week's episode is someone who is very knowledgeable in what reality may actually be, what we can do with our own reality. He has been on a mission to help others find and earn financial abundance. He has been featured on many different talk shows, podcasts, and videos. He is an author of 11 books. Some of his works include Attract Money Forever, How to Attract Money Using Mind Power, 10 Metaphysical Secrets of Manifesting Money, and The New Normal. I'd like to welcome James Goy Jr. to the show. Hello, Dylan. Thank you for having me. I'm happy to be here. I'm happy to have you. I'm really excited to have you. You're, you're a very knowledgeable guest, and uh, you've been through been through many adventures. I have been. That's true. So, would you call yourself a what? what what's the label? Like a, a metaphysical writer? Um, is that is that is that fair? I, yeah, I consider my spell, myself a metaphysical slash spiritual uh, writer or and uh, or author. And, and uh, also, uh, I mean, other labels I would put on myself are um, advanced mind power practitioner. I've done amazing things uh, in that regard. I'm an experienced lucid dreamer. I'm a natural born astral traveler. Um, so I've got, uh, I'm somewhat of a, a psychic or medium to a, a certain degree in certain ways. So I've got all kinds of stuff going on behind these eyes here. So what got you started in all of this and on your journey to help others and to write all, all these books? Right. Well, you know, my, my uh, indoctrination into things that are other than the physical material uh, world or dimension, things that people see really started when I was uh, somewhere between five and six and a half years old. And I know the age because I know the house we were living in at the time. And that's my first memories of having out-of-body experiences. Um, I didn't know they were out-of-body experiences, um, but uh, my mother tells me that back then <clears throat> I hated to go to bed. I hated to go to sleep. And so what would happen was I would wake, I didn't understand astral travel or out-of-body experiences, but I would wake up, for instance, sitting on my bed at you know five, six years old, and I would think I'm awake, obviously, but actually my body was asleep. And uh, there was always, it was always dark and there was always a uh, really scary feeling. Uh, but I can give one quick example of something that happened. Um, I had a recurring dream, every so-called dream, every night for about a week or whatever it was. And there was this old, this is back in uh, New Jersey, and there's this old Italian lady who lived across the street from us. And she was a crotchety old mean thing. And so one night I, I'm in my bed there and she's in my room sitting in a rocking chair and she's rocking back and forth, back and forth and her eyes get real crazy and she starts uh, kind of like, uh, at one point she starts howling and wind is blowing in the room and the, the roof actually comes right off of my room and the, the, uh, the um, rocking chair at this point is spinning around like a tornado and then goes up through the roof. And I had this dream every single night, the same dream. It was terrifying. Wow. And uh, one morning, I go out to the kitchen, and my mother says, uh, so-and-so, I don't remember her name, the old lady from across the street died last night. And I never had that dream again. Uh, and now, right now, I'm getting all of these uh, pinpricks all over me in the back of my head and even on the sides of my faces because... Anytime, everything is energy, everything is consciousness. So by me remembering that experience and telling you right now, I, I, I became aware of her, she became aware of me. So Reality you, is non-local, there is no distance. And so we just made an energy, I made an energy connection with that person um, just now, just by discussing her with you. And you were able to travel to her location is what, what was going on then? There is location if we if we look into quantum physics it's the it's the uh, theory of non-locality that there is no distance there's no time there's no space there's no past there's no present future it's all consciousness and so we are where ever and with whoever our consciousness is and so i just basically connected with her she didn't come i didn't draw her here i didn't go there we connected in consciousness can you can you touch on that then the material world is an illusion and then possibly even like manifesting reality through consciousness? Certainly. Um, 
And material reality is an illusion in that we mistake it for being something other than what it is. And so we think that it's physical. We think that it's solid and material. And so, um, uh, for instance, if I knock on this table, this desk I'm in front of, it feels solid. And so, so does my hand. But we know now, of course, that if we take a powerful enough microscope, we can look into this table deeply enough and the molecules and atoms are as far as part as each other as the moon and the sun and the planets. Right, there's, there's too nothing much space. Solid. Yeah. Exactly. So, uh, so there is no solidity. Now, if uh, I keep a dream journal, right? So almost every night I remember dreams, out-of-body experiences, lucid dreams, astral travels. Um, but when I'm in it, let's say you're in a normal dream. Let's say you had a dream last night and you remembered today. Well, when you were in that dream, you th just thought it was real. You just took everything at face value. Even if something really bizarre happens, like somebody walks in the bar, let's say you're in a bar and somebody walks in with three heads and you'll say, you won't say, oh my God, well, that doesn't, that, that I must be dreaming because that doesn't exist. Most people would say, oh, what, a, what an unfortunate person for a guy who was born with three heads. In other words, we, we justify everything to right. fit so that we don't have to be pulled out into the unknown territory of what we're looking at is not actually real. So everything here is, you know, an energy and matter are interchangeable. And uh, they do, in fact, interchange all the time. But here's the thing. The energy, the thought behind the thing is actually more real than the thing. And I can, I can prove that just by a little, little illustration. If I have a, uh, an af a dream or a goal and I see myself in a certain position or with a certain amount of money or possession, and I build that in my mind. Uh, people say, well, thoughts become things. That's a popular thing, especially from the old turn of the century writings. Well, thoughts don't actually become things. Thoughts are things. And they're actually more real than the things themselves that eventually manifest. And here's my, my proof of that, theoretically or conceptually is that the thing I build in my mind, let's say it's $100,000 in the bank or a million, or let's say it's a six bedroom house or something, it exists in my mind. It, it has been created in a, the world of consciousness and energy. And eventually I can see it here. Now the house here, the fortune here, the bank account, whatever it is, is supported by, and it was actually given rise to uh, by and came from the thoughts. But you see, the thoughts were able to exist without the thing. The thing came into manifestation because the thoughts were the foundation. The thing yeah, can never exist. Solid. Nothing will ever come into, right, nothing comes into manifestation without the thought to hold it. And now if I'm thinking I have a, a hundred million dollars and I'm able to build that up, create it, and then maintain it, but as soon as I start to have negative thoughts, in other words, I no longer have the mental foundation to hold that money, it'll start dwindling here because it needs the foundation to hold it. So this world is an illusion. It's not what it seems to be. It's not solid. In, in quantum physics, there's even the, the, the concept that, uh, you know, until you walk into a room, uh, it's basically um, a field of potential. And they, they do that. They've figured all of this out with quantum experiments. I'm not a quantum physicist, but, you know, they can't, um, they can't accurately uh, tell or measure that both the the position and the you know trajectory or whatever of subatomic particles, um, waves, uh, uh, particles can act either as waves or as particles, which are supposed to be two different things, but can be one or the other depending on, uh, so it gets pretty thick, but the concept is that, and it goes back to the mystics and everything. Uh, here's the thing, the, the observer and the observed are not separate. All there is is consciousness. And so everything that I see um, is a part of me, but it's all based in consciousness. And so basically we are not discovering uh, through scientific inquiry, we're, we're not discovering reality. We are creating it as we go based on what we're looking for. And that's a very big thought. And most people in the material world are not going to be able to really fathom that right now, but really um, we are discovering, we are creating instead of discovering everything that is coming about because it's all based in consciousness and indeed is all, it all erupts from consciousness. 
is it fair to say that it's a simulation then? Uh, I would think so. And a lot of, uh, you know, people um, who are, uh, you know, computer savvy, computer whizzes and, and the, the uh, code guys and all that, I've heard some of them talk and it's, it fits the definition. I mean, it's like the perfect simulation and I'm not a computer person and I'm not techie, so I can't really uh, give you all the examples like I've heard from them. But uh, yes, it's like kind of like the hollow deck on the on the starship, uh, you know, that second uh, series of the uh, Star Trek or whatever. Mm -hmm. but that is exactly what we are in. It is exactly uh, that. And what we, we're interpreting it as something other than it is. And that's why we call it an illusion. Now, do you do you come from the kind of the same school of thought as a lot of the, the psychic mediums and whatnot that what is the reason for the simulation? Is it just to learn and to be able to like to gain knowledge of things that we can't do in spirit form or energy form? Well, you know, that is a really good question. Um, it's kind of like, I have a book called The God Function. And so it's kind of like the question of uh, what is God? Or first of all, does God exist? And then second of all, if God does exist, what is God or what is God like? But we, in our human um, uh, bodies, our human minds and consciousness, which is all a projection anyway, it's not actually physical as we've discussed, are we really, I think it's the height, like I write in the book, it's the height of human folly and arrogance for a human person thinking strictly with their human mind to think and to be uh, so confident in themselves that they have an answer like, what is God? Or what is God like? Or why am I here? Or what's the purpose of all of this? Right. We don't even realize we're dreaming. We don't, even most psychics and, and mediums and all, they don't understand the quantum physics. Right. You know, they don't, they don't understand. And so for them to, um, now what they say may be true. I'm not saying it, it, it's whatever they want to give it the reason it's true or not true. But I think the ultimate um, goal of consciousness is the consciousness of consciousness. In other words, we're unconscious consciousness right now. And the more conscious we become, I think for me, the more I discover that the meaning of life and the purpose of this and the reason for that is pretty much what I say it is. Because I, when I start to recognize myself as not being an individual, as being one tiny molecule in the, in the vast um, um, mind of consciousness, when separation starts to fall away, um, then, and, and when we realize that everything that ever happened, not only that it, it didn't have the reason we thought, but that it actually didn't happen. It's like if I wake up this morning and remember a dream last night, I say to myself, well, thank God that didn't really happen. This didn't really happen. Um, it's not happening right now. And so it, it gets deeper and deeper but the more you, you look into it, the more, you, uh, for me, I stop asking questions like, um, what's the reason, what's the purpose, what's the this, what's the that? Because until I open my consciousness full enough to be able to understand that, first of all, I won't be me anymore and an individual. And second of all, I won't care. I wouldn't even ask a question because it's, it's uh, a pointless question. And so I hope that wasn't too convoluted, but that's kind of, no. you know, it, the more I, I've discovered, the more that you, that you open up over the years. I mean, I've been around for more than six decades and I've been having psychic and weird experiences since I'm like five or six years old. Um, the more you just start realizing that things are and stop questioning why they are, but start trying to understand more and more how they became th this way so that I can make them more of what they need to be. Because obviously in my personal life and in the world in large, there are, there's room for improvement. And I'll hasten to say that I'm not judging things as good or bad, right or wrong, but I, my, my big judgment in life is, um, and not even positive or negative, but is it wanted or unwanted? Is it desirable or undesirable? And I think that part of the reason we are here is to understand that we're making it all 
and that we can choose to make things more and more desirable and less and less undesirable. And that helps us and everyone else. And anything that helps us helps everyone. And anything that helps anyone else helps us just by the mere fact of those happening. So I think it's safe to say, you know, you're saying that, you know, basically the dreams are kind of part of a reality in its, in its own, then, then it's safe to say that your opinions on say like a DMT experience or ayahuasca is a similar, a similar thing. Uh, like when you're talking about psychedelic uh, experiences? Or, yes, sir. Yes, right. sir. Yeah. yeah. I think that what happens there, it's probably pretty obvious to most people, is that it's, it simply uh, bypasses a lot of our filters that we have on ourselves of perception. So uh, some people would say, well, you know, like back in the 70s and stuff, you know, you drop some acid and you're going to hallucinate. But are you hallucinating? Or are you able to now see more clearly into realms that before you just weren't tuned into? Um, I, I myself, uh, I prefer the method. In other words, like with lucid dreaming, they have different tools. You can wear a mask that will flash a light and you train, you know, you wear it over your eyes like goggles and it'll flash a light and you train yourself to um, uh, question whether you're dreaming or not when you see a light change in your dream. Well, I prefer not to use those. I prefer to do everything with the tools at hand, which is just me, just whatever I have. And so, and I feel the same way about uh, that. And I'm not saying it's right or wrong. I think that there's wonderful uh, benefits, especially, I mean, you can, you can, uh, uh, you know, treat mental illness and everything else with these uh, different um, substances. For me, I'm, I'm, in, I'm a purist, I like to think. And so I'm totally in, in it for the same experiences, but totally on my own merits. And so maybe it won't mm -hmm. take me, you know, 20 bucks and an hour to get there. Maybe it'll take me 30 years to get there uh, to the same place or have that same vision or whatever, but I'd rather do it uh, on my own Naturally, because I think yeah. it's more, more permanent. Yeah. And it's more permanently a part of me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about coincidence and synchronicity versus synchronicity? Right. Well, that's a good question. I never heard it put that way. Co coincidence versus synchronicity. Well, the first thing I would have to say is we really have to look at this word coincidence. And is there a such thing at all, ever? And the further we look into how consciousness works and, and read even just, you know, just, you know, mildly from quantum physics and whatnot, um, you really have to quench, question coincidence. Uh, everything, nothing happens in a vacuum. Everything happens from something. And there's a cause for every effect. And therefore, in the truest sense of the word, probably nothing really is a coincidence. And probably everything is synchronicity. Even things that we wouldn't think of as being synchronistic. But I think when we start looking deeper into the mechanism of consciousness, we're going to understand that maybe that's all there is, synchronicity. There is nothing haphazard. There is no chaos. There, there is no un, you know, uninformed, un, illogical, unfocused uh, uh, things happening without a reason. Everything is happening exactly as it's supposed to happen. One of my new books, and that's a very deep concept, but one of my new books, uh, the four that I'm working on now that I haven't published, it will be the next one I publish unless something like the new normal pops up and comes out of nowhere and <laughs> has to be put out right away. But it's, it's on uh, divine order. And that happened with, with uh, the new normal. It came out of nowhere from the thought from the starting to write it, 21 days later, it was actually in print. It was published 21 days later. It was just an unreal experience. But barring something like that happening, um, my book on divine order will be the next book that I, I write, uh, that I publish, that I'm just tweaking right now, you know, editing it, proofreading. Um, and so basically that concept is that uh, everything is in divine order. So just an easy example is I lose, uh, someone loses, um, their job, and they get fired or whatever. They have a chance meeting with a friend that they haven't seen for 20 years that's back in town now or whatever at the grocery store. 
this leads to a couple of dominoes falling and this person getting a job which was even in every way better. They like it more, they like the people more, it's a shorter travel, it's more money. Any way you could think of it's better, it's better, right? So the people who even want to entertain the concept of divine order will say, well, that's great. This guy had this problem, this terrible thing, and it happened, but then divine order came in, powers that be, um, mind power, you know, divine intervention, whatever, and fixed it and made this other situation. But we have to look one layer deeper. If the person did not lose the job to begin with, they would never have this wonderful position, which is in every way better suited for them and for the world. It'll be a position they can add more value to the world. It could not have come about unless the person had lost the job. So there are no problems. If you look at that situation, there was divine order all the way through, including losing the job. Again, everything in divine order, everything uh, synchronistic, and everything uh, just as it's to be for the highest best good of all concerned in the overall picture. That's what, that's what one thing we can recognize about consciousness is that it's very intelligent and it is um, positive as opposed to negative. It's helpful as opposed to harmful. It blesses as opposed to curses. And once we really start to see the wonderful power of that whole mechanism, we can really just sit back and relax. Even what's, what's going on right now, whether it's you know uh, violence in the streets or the so-called pandemic or whatever, and we can, we can step back from it as human beings and take a new look at it as spiritual beings and saying, okay, well, you know, I may not all understand it all right now, but I'm not going to judge it. I'm not going to fear from it. I'm not going to, you know, run from it. I'm going to understand it. I'm going to allow it to be what it is without, um, uh, you know, fighting back on my part. And I'm going to see what blessings are involved here and what good is going to come of this. And yeah, you, they're always it. There always are if we look for them. You know, you talk about that the synchronicity with the guy losing his job and finding a better job. I think everybody, if they really stop and think about it, can find synchronicities like that that, that has happened in their life. That's that's, that's led right. to something that's been life changing or almost like it was meant to be. Now, do you think right. that do you think that takes free will out of the out of the equation? Now that's another uh, really <clears throat> big question. Free will. I mean, that can go in so many different directions. I mean, we can we can even question. Uh, I mean, first of all, we can start to say we talked before about non-locality that nothing actually is happening or has happened. Therefore, we never really did anything. Therefore, what would there have been free will needed for? Um, but so, but in my own life, I have this really strong sense of destiny, like I'm being pulled along and it's a train that I really can't um, control, yet I recognize on another level that, I mean, you bring up the free will. And so now I'm going to use my free will to take this pen and to tap my hat, tap myself on the head with it. Now, I just apparently exercised free will to do that, but some people could argue and say, well, uh, no, that was destiny, that he was going to say this, that you were going to do that. So that's another one of those questions that uh, the further out you want to you wanna take a look at it, I, I, this, this might seem at odds, but I believe as much in free will as I do in, in uh, preordination and, and predestination. And I don't think that they need to be... Um, mutually exclusive, I think they are probably two sides of the same coin. And I think that when we look at it from a, a, a high enough a spiritual vantage point, we will see that, <clears throat> again, it's a question that doesn't even matter because everything is what it is. And as soon as we try to put a label, free will or predestination or whatever, then we're, we're breaking down something that's bigger than we're trying to break it into and therefore we won't be under able to understand it because we're not looking at the whole again we're looking at tiny little pieces just like modern uh mainstream medicine does with the human body mm -hmm. you know heart specialist brain specialist but and and they get everything all messed up um because they're not taking a holistic view and so when we do uh 
uh, you see that free will is uh, predestination. Left is right, up is down, there is here. And it, it, it's, it, it makes everything so vast that you can barely comprehend it. But at the same time, it brings everything down to a tiny uh, pinpoint where it can be fully comprehended and understood and mastered. And, and that's all at the same time. That's the kind of, that, that's why very few people, in my opinion, even some of the, you know, a lot of the teachers, uh, if you really sit down like me and you are doing, and you brought this into a very high level of conversation right away, but if you sit down with some of them, they're not, they're going to like, oh, well, it's this, and oh, I definitely, it's free will, and, and here's why. And, you know, that's a human brain right there that's, yeah. that's ma you know, going by past memories, what they've heard, what they've learned, and, and their influence they've had, and, you know, whether their mother was good to them as a child, who knows what it is, but that's all it is. And I have to get, get out of myself right away and look back down on this pile of flesh sitting in his chair and say, wait a second, is he, is he really qualified to even answer that question? You know? And, but then I think, oh, no, he's definitely not, but maybe I am, whoever this is looking down at him. And then I can start to theorize, you know, forget him because he doesn't know anything. He's got a human brain full of, you know, chemicals from the air and the food and everything else. Let's forget him. But there is this higher part of, uh, of each of us that we can, we can rise up into. But you're probably already getting a sense that the, the more that person starts trying to put things in perspective, the more convoluted they become. The more, you know, if you say, is it left or right, you find out it's both. And then if you keep querying, you find out it's actually neither. And it all seems extremely bizarre, but then it also makes perfect sense. And that's, so that's the kind of thing that um, you're going to lose a lot of people along the way in a yeah. conversation like yeah. that. Good answer. So in your books, you know, you, you seem to be able to help people gain a financial increase what are some of the beliefs or success stories from some of your readers? Right. Well, um, I've, I've gotten, um, you know, letters and emails over the years. Uh, some people like how, how to attract money using mind power was my, my first book I wrote. And, you know, I would get um, the ones I love best are when someone says, and I've had more than one of these that they ordered my book. And then they had this great financial miracle. Someone gave them a car, so now they could go to work, or they got this big, huge refund that they weren't expecting or something. And they always say, what a coincidence. I didn't even get the book yet. And I like to tell people, no, that wasn't a coincidence. That You were already doing everything in the book, even though you hadn't read the book. You had uh, um, come to understand that you can do things with your mind. You became excited about, at the prospect. You believed it might be possible. The proof is that you bought the book. You started thinking about the things you might be able to create or that you, and, and so everything that's in the book, you're already doing just based on the fact that you bought the book. Um, but it's been things like that. I like to talk about sometimes my own experiences because I have uh, used mind power, um, especially for money, but for other things in ways far vaster than any of my readers ever have. They have, you know, little, um, uh, they, they have experiences, they do increase their livelihood, but some of them, I speak to them years later and it's like, well, you know, I did this and that, uh, in the beginning, this and that, but you know, the last three years have really been, you know, hell, heck, you know, uh, does it, does this really work? And I say, well, how many times have you read the book in the last three years? Well, you know, I haven't actually read the book in the last three years. Okay, well, obviously you let your consciousness sink. When you raised it up, it worked. And when you lowered it, it did. I told you one experience uh, earlier when, off air where I went from $50,000 in credit card debt as a household to two six-figure uh, windfalls in a three-month period. Mm -hmm. But uh, money-wise, that's bigger. But I'd like to tell you about experience that I had uh, many years before that. We were $10,000 in credit card debt. And I already knew all of these uh, principles and things I'd been studying for a number of years. I'd already used it to have different manifestations. But I thought to myself that I know met metaphysical techniques work. And if, if any of them will work, then any one of them will work. And so let me keep this real simple, I thought, and just pick one technique and see what I can do with this $10,000 credit card debt. So I came up with this simple affirmation, all of my credit cards are completely paid off. 
I was working a very low paying job at the time, taking care of a developmentally disabled senior man across town. I would drive my bike to his house, ride my bike to his house. But anyway, I started doing that affirmation morning, noon and night out loud as I was riding my bike to work and this and that. About four to six weeks after I started that, someone came into my life that um, I'd only met once or twice before and didn't know that well, but uh, synchronicity uh, brought all of this together. That person's life started to change drastically right about the same time I started doing my affirmations. Four to six weeks later, they're in my house right in front of me, having just left their old life within a day and having come into in that process a whole lot of money that they didn't have before. They heard about the $10,000 debt and wrote a check on the spot for $10,000, not as a, as a loan, but as a gift. And then as the credit card bills came wow. in over the next month, whether it was 4,000 or 500, whatever it was on that card, it got paid off. And, and that, that um, shows a very um, powerful uh, part of the process, which is, I came up with the mental blueprint of what I needed and wanted, but I didn't try to come up with how I could do it. Indeed, before I decided to finally give up doing that and just do the affirmation, I did try to think of any way possible I could get out of this credit card debt, and I couldn't think of anything. But what we learn is the universe always can. There's always a way. If we can envision it, if we can create it in the mental, spiritual, uh, emotional realm, the realm of energy, then it can happen, but we have to hold that vision and then stay out of the way, keep our doubt out of the way, and stop, completely just relax and step back and stop trying to figure out all these kind of ways we could do it. Because I never could have thought of that in a million years, number one. Number two, there wasn't anything else I had to do other than the affirmation. And then boom, the person sit in front of me uh, a, month, a, half, a month and a half later, and they're writing me a check. That's how it works, but we have to know what we want, create that vision, and hold on to it. There's been other six-figure windfalls over the years. Uh, just, I, 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 for a while, uh, for years, really, when I was walking around town a lot in the different places I live, I would, I would put my mind on on finding money on the ground. Now, if you go for a walk in any you know city or town of a good size, it's not unreasonable that you might find a penny on an hour walk, you know, down different. But I found myself uh, just really freakish. Like uh, one day I remember I'd already picked up a few coins. Then I'm going down the street and a dog's coming from the other a guy with a dog. And so I don't want to be right in the path of that dog because I don't know that dog. So I walk around the car. On the other side, right outside the driver's door is a pile of change. Like the guy must have been or a woman drunk the night before and they drop like a quarter or, you know, like four or five coins just right there. And it wouldn't have happened if the dog wasn't coming down the street. And then other times I, I've decided, well, I usually have a standard route I take and I would uh -huh. take a different route and I'd find money. I'd find a couple of $5 bills folded up together, just right on the, in the, so I'd come home. It just massively, massively, like I probably, by the law of averages, I, I should have been hit by lightning three times on that walk more than finding money in these different places in these different denominations in one hour. It's really freakish. But like the, the, uh, or, or I'll just decide to cross the street in a place I don't usually cross the street or the, the traffic. If I'm crossing a major street to get back to where I was, the traffic will clear up right there. I scoot across the street. I remember one time in particular, there's a quarter right on the curb, right exactly where I had to go because that's where my opening was. That's the kind of freakish stuff that, that happened. It's not a lot of money, but when you look at what it represents, it's, it's the process that, you know, the, you can be led and guided to everything and it's the same with you know larger amounts of, of money that's interesting Th those same principles could be applied to other areas of life right like health um things like that i mean like uh, like yeah health um safety i've had mm -hmm. this I've, I've used mind power to uh well certainly intuition but also mind power intuition has come in to warn me from certain situations but then if I've overridden that, uh, then I've had to actually had uh, divine intervention where these really freaky things happen to get me out of the situation. So much to the point, uh, one time I started a, a car, uh, me and my life partner, Kathy, we were moving between states and <clears throat> I, I was kind of naive back then. And I said, uh, 
oh, look at this map. This is a much straighter line than the interstate. The interstate's way out of the way. Let's take this road. It's straight. Well, we ended up in the middle of the desert in the middle of the night, hadn't seen any cars in either direction for a really long time, and our car dies. 1978 Chrysler Cordoba, uh, electric, everything seized up, power steering, and I just got barely got the car over to the side of the road. And uh, we got out, I looked under the hood, I don't know anything about cars, I just determined everything was there, nothing was smoking. But I started to feel something, and Kathy's very psychic as well, she's a natural born medium, as a matter of fact. But, um, so I closed the, the trunk of the car, the hood of the car, and um, I looked at Kathy and I said, do you feel that? And what I was feeling was something very, very dangerous coming towards us very quickly. Like if we were where we were like five or 10 minutes from now, we were in big trouble. And she didn't say a word. She just nodded her head up and down that she felt it also. And I said to her, I said, uh, we are getting in that car and I am turning that key and we are driving out of here right now. Again, she didn't say anything. She nodded her head. We got in the car. I turned the key and we drove off. And people think, well, that was a coincidence or you got lucky. Um, but what I, what I know is that uh, from just a lifetime of experience is that my mind is more powerful than a pile of steel and glass and wires and rubber. This is, that's only energy. That's consciousness. My mind is more cohesive, more directed, and more powerful than that pile of so-called material um, substances. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two, I absolutely had no option. First of all, I had absolutely no doubt. That I was never more sure of anything in my entire life, seriously, that that car was going to start. And the reason was because I had absolutely no choice. That car had to start. It had to. And so, you know, I tell people, really attracting money with mind power is easy. I mean, that's not, it's not even real. It's just numbers on a computer screen. It's just pieces of paper that have no intrinsic value. It's floating around everywhere. Everyone has it. And, you know, to, to figure out the, the universe, to figure out a way to channel some of that to you, that's child's play. But when you start making, you know, inanimate objects uh, animate, uh, another time I kept uh, a person from pulling a gun on me. They their hand was literally shaking in the air as they were trying to reach for the gun and they, they couldn't do it. They became paralyzed. Um, and other experiences too, even involving guns. Uh, it's just, when you understand that everything is consciousness, including those people, everything is energy, and that there's a force going back and forth, and a lot of it, when it comes to human interaction, is human will. So for instance, with that person trying to reach for the gun, well, he was at an extreme disadvantage. Uh, all he wanted to do was shoot somebody. Well, what I wanted to do was stay alive. So I had a much stronger uh, motivation, number one. Number two, I understand mind power and spiritual energy and divine intervention. I'm pretty sure he didn't or he wouldn't have been living the kind of life he was living. And um, number three, I absolutely had no choice. I had two right. people with me at the time, women women and i and i had to make sure that we all got the like kathy and her sister i had to make sure we got out of there safely so those are just a few uh uh quick little examples um, and these are all I've principles that are in your in your written work certainly yeah belief faith expectancy uh think as if feel as if speak as if uh, visualize the end result it's, and now it's, it's like all, it's like anything you got to practice yeah. right you got to practice well that's the thing. I mean, nobody's going to go out tomorrow probably and make somebody's arm freeze in the air. And by the way, I, it wasn't like I was trying to, people think, oh, it's, it's like um, uh, mental, you know, mental coercion or mind power over other people. I was not using any mind power over that person. I was using mind power over the circumstance. And there's a difference. If I would have tried to um, make him change his mind or anything like that, then that's more, that's kind of like black magic. Yes, I'm overriding the will of another human being. I didn't have to override his will. I allowed the universe to override the circumstance because my end goal was to not get shot and for the three of us to get out of that vehicle safely at our destination, which we were heading toward an airport. 
And um, I didn't care how that happened. And I didn't have any ideas. I, did, I wasn't like, oh, he can't get the gun or, or when he pulls the trigger, it'll backfire. I, I didn't have any ideas about what needs to happen except for the end result, which is we need to be dropped off at the airport um, safely. And it was really funny because uh, when we got, and there was, there was a whole nother, I mean, that's the short end of the story. He was trying to pull off of a certain exit where we know it was the wrong exit. And, and he was jerking the wheel and you could see the wheel physically jerking back. I mean, it was straight out of a you know, sci-fi movie or something, paranormal movie. But when we got to the airport and the three of us got out of the, uh, the vehicle, um, first of all, I tipped the guy $20, which people find, uh, you know, uh, humorous. Uh, he was sent to make sure that we, we didn't get off the, out of the place we were. I won't, I won't say where we were, but we weren't supposed to leave. And, uh, and I was expendable uh, one way or another. The girls had to be brought back. I was expendable if that was necessary. Um, but anyway, I tipped the guy $20. And as we're walking away, he never said a word. He never said one word through this whole ordeal. And then as we're walking away, I kept looking back at the vehicle. And he was just, um, he looked like a statue staring straight ahead with his hands clutching the wheel. Um, like he was in shock, like he didn't know what had happened. And it was quite a long walk from where we were to where the vehicle was out of sight. And he was, again, just just glued to the steering wheel, just looking straight ahead. Um, yeah. That's the power of mind power. But, I, but I'm, uh, you know, a good person, right? And I do a lot of uh, good. Uh, I bless people by my presence, by my example, by whatever I can teach them. And so the universe has a stake in keeping me safe. And, uh, but I'm very fortunate because, I mean, uh, when I was in grammar school on a Friday night, uh, on a dark night, uh, Friday, it was dark, in a, on a main uh, street in a little town in uh, New Jersey, uh, I did something that got this girl that was a couple grades uh, older than me mad at me, and she chased me, and I ran out in the middle of the street, and I got hit by a car. Now, this was in probably the early, yeah, it was in the mid-60s. The car was like out of the 50s. I don't know what it was, but it had a big, great big grill and all that. And so this car hit me and I flew up and over the oncoming traffic and landed on the sidewalk like 30, 40 feet away. First of all, I shouldn't have gone in that direction. That's not physics, right? The, the, the vehicle hit me. I should have went, you know, the same way the vehicle was going or under the vehicle. And also with that huge distance, I flew through the air. Uh, and, and landed on the sidewalk, but I landed, I didn't like crash to the sidewalk. Even from being 20 feet in the air, I landed lightly. I had bruises on my abdomen and my upper legs where the car had hit me, and they did take me to the hospital, um, but it was, it was a miracle. My mother, my friend I was with ran, ran the two blocks down to my house, and my mother frantically ran around looking for her car keys. She finally found them, then she ran out of the house and forgot the car. And she just ran to the site. And by the time she got there, there was a priest leaning over me. And everybody thought I was dead. And I'm like, I'm okay, I'm okay. I had another one, I won't go into the, all the details, but a motorcycle uh, versus pickup truck where uh, the guy who was riding behind me, a friend of mine, he saw me right, right before impact. I felt something grab me on both shoulders of my, my uh, leather jacket, regular biker jacket with the zipper pockets and all. I felt uh, something grab me and pull me up and then my vision went out. And uh, I don't remember what happened, but he said that was the most bizarre thing because you went, you shot straight off of the motorcycle like a rocket and that's not physics. You were doing 40 miles, 45 in, in this direction and then you hit, a, a, my motorcycle was an accordion. It was completely smashed in. The headlight was smashed in, pushed in a couple inches, and nothing was past that. The whole wheel and everything was folded in. But he said, you went straight up, and you flipped around in the air, and then I couldn't see you because you're on the other side of the, of the pickup truck. Well, I didn't have a helmet on, but I landed on the soft end, not the hard end. I landed on my butt, and I, and I came to, and I looked back. Now that's freaky enough that that happened. That's out and out divine intervention. But here's the really strange thing that happened. I went to look at the, because I told you I, I was in, I've had a lot of experiences with uh, uh, entities, you know, dead people, demons. And 
So, um, but I went to look, and I wouldn't come to understand this for many years, but I went to the, li to the uh, wrecking yard to look at my motorcycle as kind of a healing thing. This might have been a week or so after the accident. And um, there was something that's very, very odd, and I, it just made me like go numb mentally, and then I didn't think about it for, for years to come. But um, the sides of the gas tank were crushed in crushed the gas tank was crushed from both sides as if my knees had crushed the gas tank and i just didn't know what that meant but i knew that ain't normal many years later i don't know how many but many years later um i had this psychic vision one day i was i was in a relaxed you know calm state kind of spiritual just and i had this vision and i saw the scene again from above from about 30 feet above and so here comes this guy, he was drunk, he was in a pickup truck, and he was coming to this part of the road where there's an opening where he, he has to wait for the oncoming traffic and then cross over and get onto a freeway ramp. This person was, was very drunk. I mean, they were sighted you know, on the scene and all that. But I saw the scene from above, and just before, he was slowing down. He was slowing way down at that point, but at the last second, he gunned his truck and it came flying around the corner and fishtailed and smacked, you know, hit I, right into my bike with the fishtailing end of the pickup truck. Right before he gunned it, I saw a dark uh, uh, form come out of the ground and go into the truck. If you can imagine that. You ever see um, uh, like a uh, shadow ghost person? with like Patrick Swayze? Yeah, you ever see Ghost with Patrick Swayze? Yeah. And they had that scene where the, those things are coming right out of the pavement. Yeah. It was exactly like that. It was a form, a human form that came out of, you know, that and uh, got into him. That's called obsession and possession. And there's all different levels of it. But got into him and, and put his foot down, actually trying to kill me. And then I saw myself. I didn't see any angels or anything, but I saw myself being pulled up and off of that. There's been so many other uh, experiences like that but um, uh, so I what, what, what I started to say was that I'm extremely blessed to have had so many experiences of divine intervention which I really didn't know until later in life that that's what they were like you know the car when I got hit by that car and all I have is bruises yet I flew all this distance and and all that and I didn't realize I realize now that um, there that I've had that. And so I'm well, more fortunate than many who don't what, believe in that because I've been shown that it's true. It's likely that you, you had a, you still had a path or a lot, a lot left to do, you know? And right. Right. Kind of like, and I've also, been, I'm a, yeah, I, I've become aware uh, that there was, there has been a lot of opposition to me um, just being here. Uh, and one time I, I drove a woman home, I'll shorten the story up to say that uh, in her trailer down in San Ysidro, uh, California, I real, uh, her, this woman that I drove home started talking in another uh, voice, a very deep male voice. And this voice was trying to convince me this was a demon within her. Uh, that she was basically possessed. She was still working a job and whatnot. She had sent her son away to live somewhere else, and uh, but she didn't know she was possessed. But this demon spent hours trying to convince me to come over to the the dark side. Um, and when you know, with the everything that happened, you would think, well, wow. I mean, the first time you hear this man's voice coming out of the a girl's mouth, you'd be running out of the place. And that's what I would have thought before. Yeah, I'm getting out of there. But no, I stayed there for hours and probably two, three hours or something and having a conversation with this thing. It knew all about me. Uh, back in the early 80s, I did the EST training. Most people haven't heard of it. Uh, Earhart seminar trainings. It was this uh, intensive spiritual thing, two weekends with a Wednesday in between, you know, all day long kind of a thing. Um, and it knew that I had done that. And it knew what my conclusions were that I'd drawn from going through it and it was turning those around and showing how they really meant something else. Uh, basically the whole message was that there's no difference between the dark and the light side. So come on over to the dark side because it's a lot more immediate. There's a lot more power that you can have right now and all this really freakish. So, um, so I've had uh, uh, things like that 
just so many things. I mean, I, I'm going to write about them. Most of my writings are not about my personal experiences. They're just about, uh, uh, you know, concepts and application. Mm -hmm. um, but I have, I'm going to be writing about a lot of these. And there's more than the book's worth. I mean, there's just so many different things that, that I've been through that I've just been shown firsthand that, again, nothing is as it seems. And in the end, it's consciousness that's the power. And it can ri override all laws of nature, inertia, human will. I mean, there's nothing that can stand up to it if it's focused and positive and directed in, in uh, such a way as that. So these dark entities, are, is that not just something that's created through thought as well? Right. Now, people would say, well, those are... Uh, maybe demons that they've never had human lives or they're extremely negative dead you know people who have died and are, are very evil and all of that other people would say well that could be a part of your own self it could be another part of you it could be a manifest it could be a thought form you know uh, through thoughts and that's an old uh, out of the old teachings where uh, if you build up a thought enough you can actually create a creature yeah that that's, now that's is, actually self-motivation supposedly have happened before Right, exactly. But again, the further, further, further out we get and we look back at it all, and when we start to understand or believe or conceive that, that all separation is an illusion, that there really is only one field of consciousness being looked at in, in uh, you know, zillions of different ways from zillions of different vantage points, then we come to say, well, was it a demon? Was it a thought form? Was it a dead person? Was it another part of me? Well, the, fur the more you think about it, the further out you get and look back, you, you have to say, it's all of that. And it's none of that. So, uh, you know, it's, it's the manifestation and it's the experience at the time. That's the meaning. But the further out you get, you, you just leave all of that behind. And you're not, you're not bound by definitions or having to believe one thing or another or answer this question or that question because in the end it's like uh, it's like a big vat that everything's being mixed around in and just try to you know identify one molecule in a 50 gallon vat of beef stew and then to watch that molecule and to be able to identify it as an individual in that vat you can't do it and it's kind of the same with human beings all beings uh, dead or alive uh, having had bodies before or not from this planet, from other planets, past, future, it's all in that same pot. And so you got, you know, we can look at ourselves as for a moment, we get to stir that pot and look into it. And we're going to try to make sense of it. There's nothing to make sense of. It's a stew. It's in a 50 gallon pot. That's all we need to know. So can you touch on the state of the world situation and how it relates to your book, your, The New Normal? Right. Uh, my book, uh, that one that I uh, just recently published, <clears throat> is called The New Normal, A Spiritual, Metaphysical, and Common Sense Take on the 2020 Coronavirus Emergency and Its After Effects. And uh, this book came about it just through, you know, synchronicity, divine, whatever you want to call it, ordination. I had the idea for this book. I, I grabbed a pen and... Um, or sat down on my computer, uh, started after I came up with an idea for the title, whatever. And uh, I, I never had an experience like this. 21 days later, the thing was in print. I mean, it was available for sale on Amazon 21 days later. And I'm looking back and I'm saying, what the heck just happened? I mean, three weeks ago, I just got this idea. And then because, you know, I've written other books in uh, a day, one book I wrote in a day on divine order, other books, two days, four days. My first book took me nine years to write. Um, but then after that, you know, um, but they still take months and months to get into print. I mean, you, you edit the heck out of them, you proofread them, you have a professional help you, you put them aside for a month, come back to it with fresh eyes and you work on, but this thing, I don't even know what happened, but 21 days later, this thing's in print and I got, I mean, it was like when I got my proof copy, I'm, I couldn't believe I'm looking at it. And by that time, it's only a couple of weeks in. And I'm like, where did this come from? You know, but a big point I make in the book is some of the things that we've already um, talked about 
about the fact that uh, none of this is real anyway. So people say, is, for instance, is the virus real or is it not real? Well, it is. It's real and it's not real. It's both and it's neither and it doesn't matter because it's, it's not the experience, it's, it's what it means to us and, and how we handle it. Um, but a, a big point that I make in the book here is um, uh, about information. And um, most people are, who are looking at this situation, the so-called pandemic, are getting their news from the mainstream sources. And so they're only getting one side of the story. And there's even some, you know, mainstream where they, you know, seem to diverge a little, but they don't diverge enough. And so what I want people to know um, is that you need to look further. You need to do your own independent research because the information is out there about what this is really about. And as we discussed uh, off air, it's not, it's not, you know, I'm not going to jeopardize my my platform of being able to share spiritual understanding by trying to um, uh, point fingers at powers that be and, and be a whistleblower or whatever the term would be. Um, but that's not the point anyway. If, if people read the first two chapters, uh, they'll, they'll take the rest of this that's going on with a grain of salt. But uh, in the book I talk, I'm looking at the table of contents, our priorities, um, uncertainty. I make a case for uh, we were much too certain before this happened. And that actually a lot of good has come from this because it has shaken our this sense of certainty that the grocery stores would always be open and we'd always be allowed to go wherever we want, anytime we want, that we'd always have freedom of movement. We should have never been as certain as we were. Most people around the world, uh, in fact, aren't. Um, so a lot of good has already come of this. But also I talk about um, uh, optimism, preparedness, and security, which really comes down to a... Um, uh, a spiritual proposition, uh, preparedness, let's face it, most people have way too little in the way of food or whatever at any given time. I mean, people literally have to go to the grocery store every week, or some people, they, they stop at the store every night on the way home, you know, they grab a thing of milk or whatever, and it's just, yep. um, it's not practical to believe that just because things have been a certain way, they're going to continue to be that way. And so that's another lesson uh, of a more practical nature that I want people to take from the book is that, um, you know, you, you, people have no idea how, um, how close civil is at any given time over the decades that have passed and the decades to come, how close civilization is to a complete breakdown um, within uh, uh, something that happens in a day, a minute, somebody gets shot on, on, on uh, fairly. Um, the power goes out, a power outage that, that rolls out and is widespread and lasts for two, three, four days. Um, this is, these are major disasters, much less, you know, natural disasters. Um, yeah, it's very like, fragile, uh, isn't you know, it? Earth and all of that. It's all very fragile, but especially the social fabric yes. of, of just how people deal with, with each other. And people think, well, yeah, I wouldn't want to be in a, in a large city because whatever, and you need to get out in a small town. Well, guess what? I've lived in some small towns and I'm, I lived through it to be able to tell people they're more scary sometime than depending on the small town, they can be much more scary than uh, a city where you can ha at least have a little an anonymity and not be so much of a target because there's not a whole lot of fresh meat around for whatever people want to do. It, it gets pretty sick and I don't get into it. Um, but uh, people need to uh, be more um, aware and prepared and thinking forward a little bit, not so gullible and not so Pollyanna. Now, yes, I'm an advocate of positive thinking and optimism, but I'm not an advocate of, of those practices where you just think that you don't have to do anything and everything's always going to work out. Uh, so that's, that's one of the lessons of the book. But really, what it comes down to is that um, it's really a spiritual experience that we're going through. And I, I, anybody who knows me, they will tell you that I have been calling this. And it's not because I'm so, uh, so uh, amazingly intelligent, but it's because I've been seeking out, like on YouTube and different sources, voices that I, I believe. Like these people make sense. 
they have everything to lose by what they're saying, nothing to gain. And so very right in the very first weeks, like here in California, they took the kids out of school and they said they're going to be back by such and such. It was a date maybe three weeks away. And I told everyone I knew, I said, you mark my words, those kids aren't going back to school anytime near that date. And guess what? Not only that, the people that are telling you they are or who gave the, the media the message that they are, they already know they're not. Um, so people are just so gullible. I, I give an example in the book of a, this doctor. People can look it up on the, inter, on the internet, YouTube or whatever. But this cancer doctor, he um, diagnosed 150, 100, let's see, how much was it? 100, I forget how many it was now. I, I probably could find it in here. But it was this astronomical, really, number of um, people. Uh, let me see if I can find it, just because it's uh, it's important. Uh, because it's a it's a uh, all right. Maybe I'll find it. But my point is, he told them they had cancer. Oh, it was 500, 500 plus people. He told them they had cancer. They didn't have cancer. He gave them chemo, radiation, and everything else. Why? To make money. To make extra money. Five hundred people. That's horrible. And my point in the book was just like, that's, it's terrible. My point in the book is just like everyone is just being spoon fed, whatever from the media about what's going on right now. Oh, okay. All right. Well, we have to wear the, okay. Oh, vaccine. Oh, I hope they come up with it quick. And they're not looking any deeper into what's going on. If any one of these people, these 500 victims would have looked uh, and said, you know, is this really, you know, and not only that, not only that they have to suspect that maybe the guy's lying for some reason, maybe it's, uh, it was a false positive or, you know, maybe, uh, maybe they really do have cancer, but the treatment being, being suggested is not the best. I mean, this is a life and death situation. You got 500 plus people who just right. completely went along, didn't ask any questions and had egregious physical harm done to them. Uh, and that uh, potentially is what's happening now or any other time with any other types of things where no one where, where the enough people aren't asking questions they're just going along with the program suffering massive loss uh pain suffering because of it and it's because they didn't even think to look any further or to think maybe this isn't true maybe i should look into this that's a big message of, of the book also the new normal and by the way uh now that i think of it the new normal and two of my other books, Aware Power Functioning and um, The Supernatural Power of Thought, I have made these free on Amazon as Kindle downloads. That's so anyone beautiful. can read The New Normal. Yeah, and my other two books. And I've got three other books. Very soon I'll be making three. And I'm just, it's just open-ended. I'm just going to leave those out there and for however long, That's you know, wonderful. a long time. It's not like you get it right now. Yeah. So I want people, especially right now, to read The New Normal. And there's no reason not to do it. If they don't have a Kindle reader, I don't either. I have a free uh, Amazon app on my computer, and I can read all the Kindle books I want. So just go to uh, Amazon, James Goy Jr., The New Normal, and just download it for free right onto Check your computer tonight, or other sure. device, your phone or whatever. Yeah, great. Real quick, I, I know I've kept you for a while, but can you just touch on a little bit more on your astral travel real quick, and then we can, we can let you go. Certainly. Um, well, when, when I was five or six, I started getting out of my body. I consider those out-of-body experiences. I physically got out of my body. As I got older, uh, I started to be able to venture further out. And so I'll give an example of uh, when I lived in Oregon one time, uh, we're up there for a year and a half the first time. And uh, every night I would find myself back in the old neighborhood in New Jersey where I used to hang out. I used to hang out with the people that were uh, on a side of town where my grandparents lived because I was down there a lot. I got to know those people. And so I actually you know, uh, hung out down there. So I would find myself every night for a period of time in the old neighborhood, walking around in the dark with no one around. And I would run across my grandfather and my grand, and we would talk, but I can never remember what we talked about, but he was not old and sick and emphysema ridden, you know, like I remember him. He was um, young and strong and vibrant, like he was in his pictures of when he was in his thirties. And, um, 
my my grandmother on my mother's side got hit by a car and uh, by a van. She stepped off the curb in front of a van. She was alive for several days, I guess, but she had massive brain injuries and stuff. And I and one night I went to I found myself in a hospital uh, in the astral realm, um, and I went and found her in a room. I knew that she's down on the left in the room. I knew she was there. Sometimes astral travel, you just you just all of a sudden become aware, like I'll be on the other side of the house and then I'll become conscious and I'm like, oh wow, I'm out of my body, you know? And then sometimes I'll go fly outside or whatever. Other times I, I wake up in my sleeping body and then there's different techniques I use. I can roll, rock back and forth or roll or just visualize myself on the other side of the room. So sometimes it's spontaneous, or sometimes it's uh, out of the, my body. Um, where I have to actually get out of it. And then I can go to anywhere. I can go to anywhere on this planet. I can see people I know. Um, and I can actually go to other, um, you want to call them dimensions or whatever. I once went to a, an alternate reality where I was there at night and all of the houses, it looked like a cul-de-sac here, but all of the houses were um, were glass. You could see inside, like nobody had anything to hide. And, and that experience, I went from being waking up in my sleeping body, rocking, getting out of the body, and then going outside, then flying up through the air for a really long time, and then getting to this thing where I had to climb over something, uh, and then ending up on this, you know, it was like quite a journey to get there. But then it's this really bizarre place that's just like here, only that one strange difference that I noticed. Uh, so, um, yeah, astral travel, lucid dreaming, which is... There's no fine line in between the two. But Let me ask you a question you related to that. Sorry, mm -hmm. sorry to interrupt. Yeah. Um, you uh, mentioned that you had visited your grandfather and he was in his 30s. Now, right. since, since time is not linear, um, do, right. do you think perhaps that he, when he was in his 30s, he actually seen you and, and talked to you? From his well, point of view. From his uh, point of view. I actually, yeah, I mean, I never thought of it like that, but yeah, I mean, there's an experience where he's at that age of his life, which is what people uh, generally revert back to, they say, where they felt the best in their life and the prime of their life, but that was an actual experience. Now, uh, people would say, yeah, but he was already dead and he was 30 many years before, but then that comes back to the fact, well, you're, you're assuming that si time is real. And that there is a forward and back and a past and, and which there isn't. So that's that's as valid an experience I had with him, with him 30 and me, me about in the same age in my 30s, probably. Um, I was in my 30s, I guess, then. Maybe even older than he looked. Now that now I realize I wasn't looking at myself. But that's as valid as experience of me remembering, uh, you know, going for a ride with him when I was, you know, eight years old or something. Neither one is more real than the other. They're That's both valid experiences in consciousness. Yeah. That's deep. You really start to think about it. I mean, he could have actually maybe right. even said something to you prior to you having that experience, knowing that he had seen you in his 30s. Right. Ah. Right. And did I go there looking for him every night for that time period? Or was he thinking of me and drew me to him? And even though, again, there was no real distance between Oregon and New Jersey, there's no space, so it right. was just consciousness. Um, but we were back in an environment that we both knew very well, that particular neighborhood. And, um, and my grandfather's a funny case because he never believed in, uh, I was all into you know, past life stuff and stuff in my early 20s. I was involved in a group. And uh, I asked him one time, I said, you know, Gramps, oh, what do you think right happens if you die? Do you think, that you'll, yeah, well, good, good. And I said, what do you think happens when you die? Do you think you'll still be conscious of it? And he said, no. He said, when you die, that's it. Um, that's the end of you. You know, that nothing exists, nothing lasts, nothing carries over. And, but various family members, myself, my father, uh, an aunt that lives right across the street, her and her husband were walking around the street to my grandmother's house after my grandfather had died and they passed him on the sidewalk. And then they were shocked and they realized, oh wow, and they turned around and, and he wasn't there. So uh, I'm just warning people that even though you don't believe you'll still be conscious after you die, um, you you will be. And, and that's another one of my four new books that'll be coming out. And one of them is uh, 
um, super, uh, spiritual secrets of uh, dead people. So exposing some of their, you know, uh, number one, you know, they're not really dead. Uh, they're just the same as they were before because people don't change just because they die. So I've got a lot. So that, that's the first book I'm writing on that subject coming out sometime soon. Fascinating stuff. Words from a very wise man. Well, James, it's been a pleasure. Where can we find all of your great work and the things you're doing? Right. Well, just go to uh, James, G-O-I-J-R.com. That's my name, James Goy Jr. Dot com. And when people are there, they can subscribe to my free monthly Mind Power and Money e-zine, which they'll receive every month. And they can also link from there if they want to the free um, Kindle uh, downloads. There'll be three more I'll be putting up soon. And uh, it's just a great way to, to stay in touch and to get some positive input for your your finances uh, um, and your mental mind work every month. So I encourage people to go just uh, James G O I J R dot com. Excellent, excellent. Thanks for being on the show, James. Yeah, thank you for having me. It's been